Faithful Christians understand and are assured that despite the problems of life, we can enjoy an abundant life here and eternal life in the world to come. And faithful children of God know that God provides help for his children in need. A missionary to China named Hudson Taylor wrote about a difficult time in his life. What circumstances could have rendered the word of God sweeter and the presence of God so real, the help of God so precious? What a blessing it is to know that at different times, difficult times of suffering and illness and grief, such as many have experienced during this pandemic, that we have the precious help of the Godhead three. Every member of the Godhead is involved in providing the help that we need. In Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 34, is a wonderful passage which plainly sets forth this idea to us. I want us to stay together this morning, this rich, rich passage, that we might know and understand God's help for his children in need, even in this pandemic. Number one, God, the Holy Spirit, helps us when we do not know how to pray as we ought. God, the Holy Spirit, helps us when we do not know how to pray as we all read with me now, Romans 8, 26 and 27. Paul says, likewise, the spirit also help with our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we all. But the spirit itself or himself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit helps. I want to say that it's my conviction that the word Spirit here has reference to the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead. That was the conviction of the 47 translators of the King James Version in 1611 and of the 101 Bible scholars who produced the American Standard Version in 1901. In fact, all of the major Bible translations I am aware of translate pneuma by capitalizing the S in the word spirit. And by capitalizing that, that means they thought that it referred to the Holy Spirit and not to the human spirit in their numerous one person translations that do the same. And so the text says the spirit also helpeth our infirmity. Notice that it's the spirit singular also helpeth our plural infirmities. If this was speaking of the human spirit, like some people think, then it would be plural spirits to match the plural our and also the plural we and we know not, but it's not, it's singular. So I believe this is the Holy Spirit. Infirmity refers to weakness. And the original word means without strength. The same word is used in Romans 5 and verse 6 where it's translated that way. For we, we, we were yet without strength. Christ died for the ungodly. He says the Spirit helps by counteracting our weakness, by helping us in prayer. In that Greek word for helpeth means, quote, to take hold with another who is laboring, hence to help in labor. This word occurs only twice in the New Testament, here and in Luke 10 and verse 40, when Martha asked the Lord to have Mary help her. Mary was covered about much serving, came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care about that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. 
And so Martha wanted Jesus to tell Mary to take hold of the load in order to help her. This word implies a heavy load, a burden that's too heavy to carry along. And when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about our Christmas tree. Because on the box of our Christmas tree, it says that it's a two-man lift, doesn't it, Ryan? So I always have to call for Ryan to come and to help me carry that Christmas tree out to the shed. It's a two-man lift. So here we have a, a load, and the picture is this. In my life as a Christian, I'm obligated to, and, and privileged to pray to my Heavenly Father, and especially with regard to the heavy burdens of life. And often the load is just so heavy that I cannot carry it alone to God in prayer. And so the picture is I get on one side and the Holy Spirit gets on the other side, just like Ryan and I on that Christmas tree. And together we carry the load to God in prayer. The tense of the present indicative verb there shows that he continues to help our infirmities. He's certainly not referring to us helping ourselves, but it's referring to help that the Holy Spirit gives us. Now, how does the Holy Spirit help us? He says the Holy Spirit helps us by interceding for us. He takes our groanings and he conveys them to the Father. I don't believe these groanings are the groanings of the Holy Spirit at all. The context clearly shows that the groanings come from human beings. You look in verses 18 and 19, you see that Paul's been talking about human suffering. And then in verse 23, he says, we groan inwardly. And so these are, these are our infirmities. These are our groanings. And he says that under these circumstances, we may not know how to pray for as, as we all, in a knowledgeable and in an articulate way. And in the word groaning, there seems to be an inadequacy that, that is expressed. It's not on the part of the Holy Spirit, no. Nor is it only on the part of the flesh of man, but on the part of the whole of man. Flesh and spirit. He says these are groanings that are not uttered there in verse 26. They're the desires of the heart, which we are unable to express in words due to extreme circumstances or being maybe emotionally distraught at the time. And the Holy Spirit takes these groanings of ours, characteristic of our feeble and, and frail efforts in trying to express in the language of, of prayer what is the desire on our hearts and on our souls. And these, the Holy Spirit, conveys to the Father. And then verse 28, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now he that searcheth the hearts is the Father. First Chronicles 28, 9, Jeremiah 17, 10, Acts 1, 24, 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. And the Father knows the mind of the Holy Spirit. Even as the Spirit presents this intercession for us, and the Father then blesses us according to our needs. So what a wonderful blessing this is that we have as children of God, that there is no problem that's so great that can befall us, even problems that may be of such severity that uh, would deprive us of the proper faculties to be able to, to pray as we ought. But God will still know our desires. Because Paul says our very groanings are taken by the Holy Spirit and presented as prayer to the Father for us. And God will answer them then according to his will. What a precious promise this is of the Holy Spirit's help in prayer. Ah, but there is more. In the second place, God the Father helps by providentially making sure that all things work together for the good of those that love him. Notice Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
Now, this is a much loved verse. It's also a much misunderstood verse. It doesn't say that only good will come in the life of the faithful child of God. Neither does it express the blind optimism that everything's going to turn out for the best as far as this life is concerned. But this beautiful verse reminds us that God is sovereign. God is working. Now we know that God worked all things together for our salvation, for our eternal good. Flip over to Ephesians 1, 10, 11. You'll see Paul saying something similar in that regard. In Ephesians 1, verses 10 and 11. He says, In the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to, to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. So you look at this language and you see how similar it is. Similar it is, And there, there is no doubt that God has worked all things together for good. That you and I might be saved. And in the next two verses here in Romans 8, he will mention God's plan for saving man. So if I'm included in that plan of redemption and I obey the will of God, I go to heaven. Isn't that good? That's as good as it gets. Isn't it? And yet I've changed my mind about this passage a little bit. I don't think we can just limit Romans 8, 28 to matters of redemption. Because when I survey the immediate context, I find this verse surrounded by references to suffering. You look back at Romans 8, 17. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. And then in Romans 8, 18, he says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And then in verses 22 and 23, he will discuss the way that we groan under suffering. And then as we've just seen, he mentions how the Holy Spirit helps our infirmities by making intercession for us. That's verse 26. And then if you drop down later to verses 35 through 39, he goes on specifically and mentions tribulation and anguish and persecution and even death. So clearly then, as I study the context more, the promise of Romans 8.28 surely includes the pain and the sorrows that we experience, such as faithful children of God has experienced during this pandemic. What about those times in life when life threatens to overwhelm you and you are not aware of the Lord's help? Well, at that time, you need to know that God is working behind the scenes. To make you a better person. And to prepare you for heaven. All things. Including. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine. Nakedness, peril or sword. That he mentions there in verse 35. Can audibly work out for our favor. If. We continue to live by faith. Look at verse 37. He says nay. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. That is to say, no matter how bad life circumstances might be, God can cause them to work together for good because he loves us. Sometimes good can result in this life. Paul had a thorn in the flesh. It caused him great discomfort. He prayed three times for its removal, 2 Corinthians 12, 8. God said no, because God said his power is made perfect in weakness. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. Good came from it as Paul learned to rely more on the Lord. And that's why Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon them. One time Paul and Silas were beaten. 
They were thrown into prison in Philippi, and yet we know good came out of that, right? Because the jailer and his family were eventually converted to Christ. Acts 16, 23 and 24. Even when we do not see any immediate good in a bad situation, there may be eternal good to come. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us, same verb, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I read about a preacher named Red Coleman who illustrated Romans 8.28 in an interesting fashion. He had a group of children hold in their hands various items, and he, he gave them out to a container of flour, shortening, salt, baking powder, various flavorings, milk, sugar, and other baking ingredients, one item per child. And that he had each child taste what they had in their hand. Well, <laughs> the two that had the milk and the sugar, they didn't complain, but the others made the awfulest faces you ever saw. Then Red took all the containers and he, he dumped the contents in a bowl. He began to mix them together and he talked about working together, both the bad things, the things that tasted so bad, and the good things. And by the time, by that time, everybody realized, hmm, Red's making a cake. And he then pulled out this cake that he already baked from the same ingredients, and he shared it with his young helpers, and they began to eat the cake, and they all agreed that when all those ingredients were worked together, they did indeed turn out to be. They thought the Turn over to Genesis 42, 20, uh, 36. Sometimes we feel like we are experiencing one bad thing after another. We, we feel like Jacob did. Jacob thought that Joseph was dead. When all the time, God was had Joseph preparing Jacob and his family a home in Egypt. But of course, Jacob didn't know that. In Genesis 42, 36, And Jacob their father said to them, Be have ye bereaved of my children, and Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. All these things are against me, mourned Jacob. When really... Everything was working together for good. Now you think about Joseph and what he said to his brothers later on. Turn to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Genesis 50 and verse 20. And Joseph later says, but as for you, talking to his brothers, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. See, in these words of Joseph to his brothers, you got one of the strongest pictures that we have of the providence of God in the Bible. And he's not saying that God calls his brothers to think evil and, and do evil against him. No, they're responsible for their own thoughts. They're responsible for their own actions. And they had to repent of those things. But God in his wisdom and in his power used their evil purposes to achieve his divine will. God worked it out for the benefit of all. God overruled their evil for good. And he does at times overrule evil for the long range good that he purposes to accomplish. And we can't always see that because we're finite. But God's always in the perfect no because he's infinite in knowledge, infinite in wisdom. And on this occasion, Joseph was smart enough 
that he could look back over his life and he could see the hand of God in his life. Oh, it, it might have been difficult for Joseph to see that when he was in chains. To see any good that might come out of all this mistreatment that he had endured. However, Joseph continued to live by faith and looking back later and seeing the final outcome, he could appreciate what God had done to overrule his brother's sin. If these things had not happened, they would all have starved to death in the great famine. Joseph said it was God's hand that was working in this. We're serving the same God that Joseph served in his day. We've got to continue to trust in God, even through the bad times, knowing that God will care for his own. You know, I read this last week, that in the United States, those who say that they are atheist, agnostic, or quote, nothing in particular is up. From 17% in 2009 to 26% in 2019 in this country. Furthermore, it said that in Great Britain, according to their most recent data, more than half the population proclaimed no faith. No faith in 2018. That's a figure that rose from 43% to 52% in a decade. Brother J.W. Thomas once asked, when an atheist is on his deathbed, his body being eaten away with cancer, to whom can he turn? On whom can he lean? I think about more than half of the people of Great Britain. knowing that God loves us and is working in our lives, no matter what happens, may be the most important help of all to us. And if we respond in the right way, trials can be a means whereby God prepares us for eternity. This promise in Romans 8, 28 is for those who love God and who have been called, called, we're called by the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. God has a plan God has a purpose, and that's a central theme of the next two verses. Read now Romans 8, 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, I want you to turn that around and look at that in reverse order. The glorified are the justified. The justified are the called. And the called are the predestinated. Right? But who are the called? Look back at verse 28. They are those that love God. But who loves God? Jesus said it's those who keep his commandments. John 14, 15. They're those that are obedient. And so the predestined are those who obey God. God has predetermined a plan of salvation. He's left it up to us to decide if we're going to answer the gospel call or not. God makes it possible. You make it a reality. And God predetermined that those who love him and conform to his son will belong to him. They're the ones that are going to be born of water and of the Spirit, John 3, 5. They're the ones that are going to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And to those that accept that invitation, they're going to be justified. God purposed in his mind in eternity to grant ultimate glorification, the glory that shall be revealed to those people. To those people. So what we what, he, what have we seen? We've seen that God has the power he's using. He works all things together for good. God has a people that he's helping to those who love God. 
to those that are called according to his purpose. God has a purpose that he is fulfilling according to his purpose that we might be glorified in heaven above. Oh, what a wonderful passage this is. Isn't it? But notice one other thing thirdly. Christ the Son helps and that he died for us, rose for us, and now also makes intercession for us. Read now Romans 8, 31 through 34. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. God is for us. He spared not his own son that he might give us all things. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Now Paul says he's at the right hand of God interceding for us. You know, often we don't think about our Lord's ascension, but that was a pivotal event in his ministry. It marked the beginning of his high priestly ministry in glory. No longer being limited to one place at a time, he can present himself everywhere as our invisible intercessor, consistently praying for us. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 7.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth, to maketh intercession for them. Our Lord came into the world to intervene for us. Now he's in heaven to intercede for us. You remember what he said to Simon Peter? Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I pray for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. He would be overcome. But Jesus said, I'm praying for you, that your faith will see you through. What our Lord did for Peter on that occasion, our Lord's doing for us now. And that makes me feel great. And it should make you feel great too. In these wonderful verses, we've seen the whole Godhead is for us. He seeks to help us. The Holy Spirit is for us. The Father is for us. Jesus Christ is for us. And by us, I mean those who love God and do his will. We must not have God against us. We've got to have him for us to have heaven await us. Declare your allegiance to him today by being born again of water and the spirit, John 3 and 5. And if as a child of God, sin is reigning in your life, as God's child, repent of it, confess it, turn to him today, and we are praying for you to come as together we stand and while we sing.